How, yes. how's this? That's perfect. Great. Okay. So I'm so pleased that you're here to join us for Living Energy Day. Um, I'll let you make sure I'm saying your name right. How do I say your surname? <clears throat> Daniel Bielan, Dr. Dan Bielan. Dr. Dan Bielan, thank you very much indeed. Well, we're absolutely thrilled to have you here today. And thank you for making the time. We've had such an interesting um, uh, day so far. And you're going to be talking about the role of the um, sympathetic and the parasympathetic uh, nervous systems um, and in relation to disease. And your website, I know, is alpha.global, um, which I had... Um, uh, a good look over earlier. Uh, absolutely fascinating. But thank you for making time with us. On behalf of everybody at Living Energy Day, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. It's uh, an interesting time being at 10 p.m. my time and who knows what hour it is and where you are. So thank That's you right. for having me. Um, yes, well, you're, you're up late in your night, I know. It's, it's four o'clock here in uh, Queensland, Australia. Um, so we're going all the way around the globe with a number of us hosts. Um, but the floor is yours. I'd like to really ask you um, to tell us a little bit more um, about your expertise, really, and, and how did you get involved in this area, please? Yeah, well, um, you know, I'm, I've kind of been a little bit outside the box in most of my life. I was doing psychic research at the age of 16 at UCLA with Alma Moss and Curly in photography. And at the same time, or alternating with a neurophysiologist who's a top neuroscientist now. Um, and I had a lab at, at UCLA during the time I was in high school. When I went to college, I went to UC Davis and was a physiology major and was also doing research in neurosurgery with uh, uh, doing um, experimental stroke research with uh, minimizing brain death during stroke. So I'm, I have a, an extensive medical research background. However, when I became uh, 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 exposed to um, conventional medicine, uh, was around neurosurgeons that just have a, a tunnel vision way to see uh, disease and most of their job was to either work on the back or tell people they were going to die from brain tumors. And I'm not sure I wanted to be doing that. So I decided to go to acupuncture school instead of medical school. And I, well, at the same time, was doing gastroenterology research at UCLA. Um, so I had about seven years academic medical research. And so I'm one of the few acupuncturists um, doctors of oriental medicine that have a research background. So I like to look at things scientifically and that carries through to all the trips I started taking to Germany because in Germany they're so far ahead because they're doing conventional medicine at the same time. They're open-minded to natural medicine and biological medicine and I started studying blood and living blood uh, according to Enderlein who was a uh, a, a pioneer in a, trying to understand what happens in disease, what does the blood, when you look at it living, not just a smear like your hematologist does, but when you actually keep it living, and the best way to watch blood that's living on a slide is through the dark field microscope. So I studied with six of five of Enderlein's direct students. Enderlein had been long dead. But um, then I brought this to the United States and trained about 250 physicians in how to look at this. And even a professor of pathology at UC Davis, um, when he was retiring, he decided to buy a $50,000 microscope and trade in his small plane uh, to be able to look at blood in a different way than he had done for 40 years. So... Uh, and bringing this, I spent a lot of time in Germany and a colleague of mine who was a, 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 a friend and he was also a student of Dr. Schimmel, who's very famous with electrodermal screening. Uh, Dr. Bonis came to me and he said, I have this device in my office I want you to look at and you should bring this to the United States. And it's called regulation thermography. It's not infrared camera. The problem with the infrared cameras, you know, I'm sure you've heard of infrared cameras doing breast analysis and some do whole body, but 85% of the cameras that are in the world are not meant for the human body. They took industrial cameras 
and they decided to use them to try to analyze an image of the vasculature of the body. So that caused them a big problem because the lack of resolution when you're trying to measure temperatures in too wide of a range, you don't have as good a resolution in the human body uh, uh, needs for reflecting pathology or disease states or pre-disease states. So the radiologists 25 years ago, and I know, I know the top radiologists at Harvard who I uh, have spoken with and I'm possibly doing a future study with, they've kicked out infrared cameras. They want nothing to do with them. Really? The, chief, the chief analyst for radiology at the FDA has said, I will never approve another infrared camera. And most of the infrared cameras that are out on the market now do not have clearance from the FDA. They just went ahead because one other or two other companies did it. And the problem is if the technology was really good, it wouldn't have a 50% false positive and false negative. So women who go in and they might have a breast lump and they don't want a mammogram are not necessarily going to find a good answer with an infrared camera. And this could endanger them. We don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater. Now, if you don't want a mammogram, get an MRI. Yes. Uh, so some people get an ultrasound, but many times an ultrasound is not good enough to show a, a, a tumor. There are certain dense breasts that it's very difficult to discern a tumor from. So, so I think that's one big, big takeaway there. So I was going to ask you, you know, what are the three most important things that one needs to be aware of, perhaps as a layperson? So what you're saying is, when you get your breast exam, get an MRI. That's the most foolproof analysis. Yeah, and if you can possibly avoid contrast, because the contrast media involves heavy metals. Now, they're lurking on new contrast media that is uh, without heavy metals. So the future of MRI is really promising. And we don't want to, to ever not have imaging. And this system that I'm involved with, that I've now brought all over the world, uh, from the German system, we only improved it. I didn't invent anything. I only improved the system that was already there, cleared them through FDA both times. This time was a lot harder because they're a lot more uh, critical of anything else coming onto the market except their own X-ray and MRIs and PET scans. So I, I had to convince them that this was different. And the way that it's different is we're not taking an image anymore. The imaging is left to the radiologist's expertise. We're actually taking digital measurements two times before and after a cool air stress to the body. So in other words, if we take two measurements and you stress the body in between, you know, like a treadmill when your cardiologist uh, um, uh, stimulates your autonomic nervous system and all of your reserves to act and your adrenals to shunt the blood to different parts of the body. This is the secret to health. To be able to look dynamically at the body is the key to what's missing in medicine. And just think, if we could see a disease that's being generated, say a cancer, that won't be visualizable as a, a tumor of some million cells. But if, what if we were to look at the terrain of the body, the autonomic nervous systems control of the tissues. And this has now been proving, proven by a group at UCLA in neurology, at this famous Walter, uh, Reed Neurological Institute. A team of scientists has proven that spread of a cancer is highly dependent upon the imbalance of the sympathetic nervous system. So people who have a small tumor and have it removed and then they're forwarded to chemotherapy, radiation, or hormone uh, suppression, we can know what kind of therapies would be best because we want to look, we'd be able to measure, if we could measure the sympathetic nervous system and see how imbalanced it is. In other words, we're, you know, when we're, say, in a, our city lives, pressured by our jobs, pressured by survival, pressured by the media, putting all these, this stuff in our brain and we're not meditating every day or doing yoga or tai chi or doing relaxation, 
we're going to have an imbalanced sympathetic nervous system. We're going to use up these reserves. And it's been proven that the spread of a cancer is enhanced up to four times with problems of the sympathetic nervous system. Well, what if we could measure exactly what's happening to the sympathetic controls of the tissues in all their regions? And this is what this technology regulation, and now we call it thermometry, because thermometry is a mathematical measurement of the stress response. So we take numbers. What does numbers mean? It means that we rule out the subjective eyes of a human observer. So that means that an eight-year-old could take the measurements that we take and we'll get the same results no matter what. And it the, inter the interpretation subject. is based upon 30,000 patients that have been gathered over the last 25 years of regulation thermography in Germany. So in other words, 40 years ago, a famous uh, German physician uh, uh, named Schwamm determined that it's much more helpful to take two measurements instead of just one. Because then we can look at the body dynamically, how it changes. And we have all the, we have so much more data, we can see trends of the body. And so if we can see trends of the body and those points that we're measuring are coming from innervated uh, regions like the liver is coming from the thoracic vertebrae, I don't know, I think it's five. So there's messages from the internal organs that are being carried like a conduit through the autonomic nervous system's control of the skin temperature above that region of that organ. So over here on my upper uh, right abdomen, just below my ribs, there's three points we measure that represent possibly indications from the liver that we can then and the FDA has examined this and they've, they've determined, as we have, that we can assess, if we use this with all our other tests, we can assess neoplastic conditions. That means a condition of the body that exists before a tumor can come because a tumor can't come unless we have a condition that is going to, to nurture that independent growth. If we um, say drink, uh, if we are alcoholic and we have liver cirrhosis and we increase our risk for liver cancer, we can see that whole cirrhotic staging all the way along because what happens to the liver region when we measure it our way, we see one temperature, we subject the person to the cool air of a normal room, but they take off their clothes to their underwear and that's enough stress to be able to get a second measurement that should normally be cooler. The second measurement on the abdomen should be cooler than the first measurement when we subject the person to cool air. However, if there's liver terrain or the, the condition that could give rise to a problem, it stays the same. If there's inflammation, it goes higher. So we subject the person to cool air, but that gets higher. This is called regulation thermometry, and we have approximately 45 signatures that have been discovered over the last 30 years by 1,500 physicians, mostly in Europe, I, and I've been involved with this for about 18 years now. So I was involved with the first device that I was told by Dr. Bonas, hey, why don't you bring this to the United States? I'll introduce you to the owner of the company and see if you can get it through FDA. So I had to find the right attorney, which is not an easy thing. And then we had to, to do this in a, a orderly way and then present it and finally got it through. Now we change the probe to a much higher uh, technology probe to an in, infrared sensor that itself is uh, calibrated to the human body and then we calibrate our whole system to the human body. And uh, so we've been now in production for about four, four years, uh, three years. We have 160, soon to be 200 devices worldwide, where I think we're in, in 17 countries now. We've just got in, we're in uh, Australia, we're in Canada, we're in North, all of North America. 
we're in Mexico, we're in uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, China, Taiwan, and Europe. Congratulations. Congratulations. So what type of, um, um, what type of um, condition are, you main, are your devices mainly involved in helping with? Well, we're looking at adjunct diagnostics, and so we have uh, several conditions that one of them is neoplastic condition, so any organ or, or uh, can be affected and can be the, the central focus of a cancer. So that's the lymphatic system, that's the you know pancreas, that's the lung. Um, then we have uh, clearances for inflammatory disorders. Well, diabetes is an inflammatory disorder, uh, uh, arthritis is the autoimmune diseases are inflammatory in um, most of the ways they exhibit themselves. So inflammatory disorders, uh, musculoskeletal disorders, because we can take measurements along the spine and we can see that there's stress in the low back or in the cervical vertebrae. That's an old chiropractic thing. And we're not really interested in chiropractic. We're more interested in internal medicine and giving doctors a tool that they can get more information to use with their other tests. In other words, I still in my practice, and I've been practicing 33 years, uh, uh, 16 years now with regulation thermography. My practice, uh, I see everything from chronic fatigue to cancer, but I never stop them from doing their orthodox and their conventional work, but I'd want to give them education. Yeah. So not only do we say, oh, this looks like you're not exercising, this looks like you have a food intolerance from an inflammatory uh, uh, disorder uh, pattern. What happens to the, there's a point right below your belly button that goes very much colder than the rest of the points in the abdomen. That's a food intolerance. And how many of us are eating foods that we're having inflammatory reactions to? Probably 80% of us, unless we're already gluten-free, dairy-free. Uh, yeah. Would you say that gluten and dairy are the two biggest culprits there? Yeah, that's the first that I look at. Sometimes eggs, sometimes nuts. Um, but uh, I think the, the gluten problem is a real problem. I think the gut needs... Uh, a couple of things. It needs a good lymphatic uh, uh, system because we have so much of our immune system is centered in the pyrus patches of the intestine. If you, if you ask any doctor, and I want you to try this someday, ask any doctor, what's the largest organ? And they'll all say, oh, it's the skin. You say, no, it's not. And you say, why? Well, if you take the intestines and you lay them out because it's composed of many villi, it's the size of a tennis court. Yeah. So we have what's known as the biome, the microbiome. This is a, a huge field now in conventional research and alternative research. If we can, we have more microorganisms in our body than we do cells in our body, including in the brain. Yes, we comprise mainly other, other organisms, don't we? Not ourselves, or not what we think of as ourselves, but actually, of course, we are the sum of the whole parts, aren't we? We're a big symbiosis. We're a symbiotic uh, jungle, a rainforest. And so that you know how sensitive the rainforest is. If one small thing can throw off many, many systems. In other words, if there's an infection in a tooth, this can stimulate an inflammatory reaction in all of the lymph system connected or in the sinuses that over time can, can compromise the body's immune system on a global scale and set up a tumor uh, uh, condition. So, so interesting you said that. If I can just interject a moment, because I was with um, Giselle from Living Valley, which is Australia's top health retreats for but serious conditions. Um, and I was with Giselle, who's the CEO there the other day, and she was saying the very first thing they do, as soon as anybody comes, they get a lot of people sent by doctors, sort of, um, you know, last resort situations for some. Um, the very first thing they do is, is look at the teeth, and they work with biological dentists. And, and she was saying that of all of the conditions they've had of um, cancer of, of, of the um, prostate, there has always been that one particular tooth which is linked to the prostate which has been rotten 
every single time. And, and after they look at the teeth, the next thing they do is to tell them to oil pull every single morning without fail. So I yeah. think you're, you're spot on. In fact, obviously you are. But it's just interesting that we're hearing more and more from so many learned people that the teeth, uh, the teeth are so vital to your health and oil pulling to detox every morning is, is a huge help. Yeah, I, I advocate oil pulling. Uh, coconut oil, I think, is probably the best, better than sesame like they use in India, but they're both effective. I like to uh, tell my patients to use a water pick, sometimes with CoQ10 or neem. You can get neem at the health food store, which is another Ayurvedic plant that's uh, anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial. Uh, we have more microbes in our mouths than most animals, so we have a whole... Uh, uh, a problem there, especially if we have root canals or if we have implants. That if you get a, if you have to get a root canal, don't. Uh, yeah. There are more cases, and I don't use my own practice for this. There, but I work with several um, institutes. One of which is uh, uh, the Par Paracelsus Hospital in Switzerland. Uh, um, who uh, has a whole dental building and there are, I have sent him probably 30 or 40 patients over the years and I can't tell you what medical conditions have responded much more positively to whatever therapy they're getting once the infected tooth or the problematic tooth is removed. If someone uh, removes a tooth, they should get an implant, but they should not get a the normal titanium implant, because I'll tell you what happens. If a person were to have a titanium implant and they were to get cancer and need chemotherapy and they get the chemotherapy that suppresses the immune system, onto the metal surface of the, of the titanium in the implant can grow what's called biofilm, which is a, a certain types of bacteria that can totally cause degeneration of the entire jaw and it can cause sepsis. So what they need to do is to get the new zirconia implant. So we have to find biological dentists or dentists that are up on the newest type of implant. And that's absolutely biocompatible and it does not provide a surface for biofilms. So there are a lot of little steps. The, yeah, well, that's uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank, thank you. The, getting back to the regulation thermography, this is the original book by uh, my teachers, Dr. The, uh, woman and, and, and man, uh, husband and wife team that decided to um, analyze the changes and you can see these marks that appear. What we've done is we've computerized the analysis of these marks because it's very, we have to teach the doctors how to analyze this, and that's now done in a much more easy way. So uh, when we set up a doctor, we teach them how to test the points, and this all comes with uh, them getting set up with a system, and then we, we have an analysis. And uh, we're going to be entering in other people's uh, uh, methods. Uh, this is a a colleague of mine, Dr. Weber, who's in Germany, and he's been doing thermography for 35 years himself, and he understands it in a slightly different way, and he uses a different type of probe, but he's still getting the same results. So we're interested in putting all the world information together to come up with the ultimate system. So we're, we're we've, uh, you know, this is my passion, this is my life, this is what I'm leaving for the planet, I'm writing a book on regulation systems of the body called regulation medicine. That means that if we go, if we have a patient that has cancer, if we tell them to run for 10 minutes and then to be totally still, and then to run for 10 minutes and be totally still, this is the kind of exercise that's called interval training. This trains your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system to balance each other. So this is what the book is about, because not only now can we measure where a person is at, but we can tell them the exact plan in which to add into their lifestyle to stimulate either the parasympathetic or sympathetic. The parasympathetic has the greatest ability, according to the UCLA research, of letting a tumor start. If we don't have a parasympathetic nervous system, what is a parasympathetic? 
if we do yoga and then we become very relaxed after doing stretches and exerting the body, yoga was built to build up the parasympathetic system. It's not a religious system. We don't, you don't have to bring any of its history or whatever together. Just look at it like a form of, in, of enhancing the parasympathetic system, which is so important in our daily life, especially if we don't live out in the middle of the country and we, you know, we're retired, which hardly any of us are. Yeah. So if we really want to prevent cancer or if we want to know in a cancer case more information about what could be causing it, because your oncologist, anyone who has cancer, the oncologist is never going to be interested in the cause of your cancer. Let me give you a, an example. I uh, had a patient come in, he's 73 years old, and he was told to go home and die. He had sarcomas there types of tumors growing through his entire body. I said, uh, you know, it's really a shame when people come in to see me that are at stage four end stage cancer sent home to die because how much can I do with herbs or enzymes or any of those things? You really can't do much because this thing is like a freight train moving forward. So what do you think about the cause of it? So I said, to um, do, 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 you know, because these types of sarcomas are related to pesticide exposure and chemical poisoning. So I said, you don't happen to do anything with pesticides, do you? And he says, yeah, <coughs> why? And I said, well, what pesticides? He says, well, I've been using Roundup for 10 years. So uh, as you know, Roundup is a lot more than it says on the label with the latest research from the uh, European Union top research team in south southern France. It's a lot worse than anybody has been told. And so uh, my job was to try to extend his life if I could. And I think we did for about three months, you know, but if you come, you know, if we, if we in alternative medicine keep getting these last, you know, last stage cancer patients, it's really not helping us to show to the world that we're a valuable therapy because really the way it should go is a patient comes in with an unknown problem, he gets our scan, he goes and gets a blood test, he goes and gets an x-ray or some imaging and you combine all the information together. And then if it's in the mild stage, he starts with non-drug therapies. We look at his, his psychology because inner conflicts during a lifespan are, are so key to making us vulnerable. So uh, something else that I'm starting to integrate in my practice is called recall healing. And uh, it's mainly taught by two people, Gilbert Reynaud in Canada and Michelle Schrader in Los Angeles. This is one of the most effective therapy methods by identifying conflicts that you've had repeating throughout your life, not just, oh, this happened to me when I was 16. It's when I was, I was eight and when I was 16, when I was 24. And they follow these cycles and it turns out that all of us are on these cycles of these conflicts that affect different organs in different ways, depending upon what the conflict was. So we try to integrate these into the early stage of prevention. The answer is prevention. Once we have it, the answer is find out all the other organs that are contributing to it. So if, if a person has a breast tumor, what could be the cause? An old infection in the tooth, a lymph infection, an endocrine imbalance where they're producing, you know, uh, hormones that are bad forms of estrogen that are stimulating a genetic or an epigenetic precondition, an exposure to chemicals. What if we could find out which one of those it was and let the oncologist treat the people the way that, that they do? We have done this over the years and the results are much, are much extremely improved. You know that they did a study of something like 50,000 cancer cases with that went through chemotherapy and that didn't and found all in all, now some cancers are 
very well treated with chemotherapy like Hodgkin's lymphoma. But the, this study showed only a two month extension of life, two month extension of life with chemotherapy. Well, if you balance the amount of money that's been placed into chemo, you know the answer to cancer is in immunotherapy. This is the cardinal seed of the answer to how we're gonna treat cancer in the future. It's in a way a form of chemotherapy, but it's not killing the patient at the same time. It's specifically enhancing immune, immune uh, activities in the ones that have, are weak by epigenetics. So all of us have immune problems but they're all different. There are so many immune syndromes of so many different uh, um, immune deficits or immune problems uh, 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 that have been carried through our bodies. And all of us could have cancer. And you mentioned prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is probably, you know, that it's in some 80% of 70 year olds and, and it mostly doesn't kill people. Now, I, there's an exception to that. It's African or African-American or Afro-Australian patients' version of prostate cancer is 10 times more lethal than in whites. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I've had patients I referred to Switzerland or to Germany, and uh, uh, some of them are being treated there with hyperthermia and other types of even low-dose chemo with hyperthermia. And um, uh, they, they're, they seem to all be doing better, but most people are not killed by certain cancers. In women, there's differential carcinoma in situ in the breast, which is microcalcifications that are not yet cancer, and they might not turn into cancer. So sometimes they biopsy it. And what happens in a biopsy? A biopsy inflames tissue, so then it goes through an inflammatory and then a recovery stage, hopefully it recovers. But if it stays inflammatory, that acts as a, a stimulator for a potential cancer to evolve itself. So if they do enough biopsies, it's been found that it could actually evolve into a cancer faster, just like X-ray can, can contribute to cancer. We have a radiologist on our board who stood up in one of our meetings and said, do you know, and he's nuclear medicine, so he understands the physics and biophysics much more than a normal radiologist. And he explained that in a dense breast, if you have one mammogram, the ricocheting of the radioactive particles is about three to four times what uh, uh, is the amount of radiation that a woman receives that doesn't have breast, uh, dense breasts. So uh, it's, you have to tell the, the imaging people what you want and you have to be conservative and you have to try to go for MRI a little bit and then you have to try to get things at the early stages. Now the first stages of microcalcification can often be reversed. Flaxseed oil has proven itself to help to reverse that calcification. What can happen with those little calcium deposits as they can reabsorb into the body and go clear. But you've got to change certain things in your digestive system, certain things in your hormone system, certain things in your lifestyle and uh, nutrition to be able to do that. We don't take a chance though. We may do another mammogram. We may send them for MRI and we want to assess and make sure we're really helping someone. And you know, we have, you have to have a knowledge of uh, somewhat knowledge of pathology, and then work with uh, work with the oncologists and the gynecologists um, to to say, well, is it possible we could wait on another mammogram for another three months and see, give this a chance? And with uh, DCIS or the microcalcifications, most of the time they'll stay okay because it's a very slow progression. It might take ten years to evolve into a tumor. So we can look at patterns with regulation thermography, um, and I can show you a little bit if I if we if can you share do, the screen. I was ask, uh, if you want to share your screen, um, and I know your website is um, alpha alpha .global, um, and I know people will have questions about. Well, yes, this is really speaking to me. If you've got the best part two hundred devices around the world, they will want you um, a little bit later to talk about how they can find 
somebody that's using one of your devices. But firstly, please do explain um, what's on your screen now. Well, do you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so what this is, is you see the yellow. The yellow means those points increased in temperature, even though we cool the body. We interpret that as an inflammatory condition. Do okay. you see the black? The black yes. are points that didn't change at all. They stayed the same temperature, even though we cooled the body. That means that the innervation of the sympathetic nervous system that's supposed to close the capillary beds and make those points cooler didn't work at all. There's a, a cut in the innervation signal. Right. That means that there's a problem in the tissue that is emanating out and interfering with a clear message from the sympathetic nervous system. So we need to have this along with a, a mammogram and she, she, this woman had uh, breast cancer and she had a positive mammogram. The uh, light blue is the normal re re reaction. And this arrow, it means that the whole, all of the averages of all the temperatures of this right breast are higher than the left breast. Symmetry is an important thing in thermography. And then we grade the signatures that we see <coughs> in terms of, do, you, do we think that the influences that are creating the situation could be coming from a vital organ like the liver or the pancreas? And this says yes. If, is there an endocrine influence? This says no. Now this is not definitive. This doesn't mean, okay, you have a diagnosis of liver disease at the same time. No, this is dynamic physiology information. It's only meant to be used with other methods to diagnose. But we might wanna send this woman to uh, get her liver function tests and get her pancreas checked for pancreat pancreatitis or for pancreatic cancer. So this gives us some ideas of where to go because it's only an adjunct, but it's a huge piece of information that we need. You see, we start out with, this is the raw data. And this is the chest, this is the upper abdomen, this is the lower abdomen, and we see patterns. These are what we teach to doctors. When you see these points going downward in the intestines, patients with candida or, or fungal infections uh, tend to have this pattern. When we see this point of the intestine going so cold, it's actually, this is the coldest point of the entire thermogram. That means food intolerance. So we have all of the ways that we teach the doctors where, where they can go. And so we can direct the doctors towards the correct uh, pathway. The teeth, they're very important and we get direct reflections of the teeth. Sometimes two teeth that are right next to each other differ by two degrees. And that's what happens when there's a, an infection in the tooth. So then we send them for a panoramic x-ray send it to a, to a dentist and I, I work with several dentists that I don't know how to read a panoramic x-ray. It's not my field. I'm not qualified for it. I send them to the experts. The experts say, okay, this look, this may not be an infection. It might be a gingivitis or they, you know, help us to the next extent. So we, we teach by uh, many, many uh, uh, methods. Uh, here was a lecture. I don't know. Can you see my screen still? Yes, perfect. Oh, just disappeared. Bring it, bring it back, please, Dr. Dan. There we go. Neoplastic condition. Okay. We have a little delay. So this is me. This is a little bit about, uh, you know, the way that, that I did this was I had a wealthy patient walk in and say, I want you to realize your dream. So he handed me a, ch a check to get started. And uh, so then I found uh, the right team where ISO and where ISO FDA UL were completely approved through medical devices, through the, the Department of Radiological Devices at the FDA. We follow FDA uh, uh, requirements exactly. 
And so we're, we're right now uh, able to, you know, that has a lot of power throughout the world. So we're also registering in every other country that we're selling into. Um, as you know, a uh, person is born, they might be born with stress that was happening between the father and mother. And then they have their epigenetic carrying information that causes triggering of genes. Then they are expect, exposed to various viruses and bacteria as a young child. They might be needing drugs, which are not great, not the greatest thing, especially antibiotics as bacteria are becoming more resistant uh, over ages. Uh, we'd like there to be vaccinations, but not with so many adjuvants that are mixed into the vaccination. Uh, the effects of diet and fast food and all the junk that's out there along with them not being organic and carrying pesticides. Then there's life trauma to that person that caused that might be a reenactment of a previous uh, conflict or a new conflict. And then the tissues begin to carry this burden, but they're not generating a tumor necessarily. There's just stress to the body and people come into the clinic with chronic fatigue or irritable bowel syndrome. And so we can look at what are the mechanisms behind this and refer them to the correct test to get a real diagnosis by using this method. And when a person does get a microtumor and it is traceable on x-ray, MRI, PET scan, we can see other factors that are involved. So, you know, most tumors go untreated for many years. So it takes a long time for tumors to generate. And so uh, we, we need to be able to look and see what is the tumor terrain. We, this is probably a big future of medicine as well as looking at the body in a more dynamic way. The problem with, again, with the infrared cameras is some of them use dynamics, but they might dip the hands in cold water and then get a response. And that's been disproven because some people have different uh, degrees of innervation and different behaviors in their individuality with the hand. So it's been well established and I'm part of a group of uh, about 1500 thermographers internationally. Uh, and we've all come to the conclusion the best way to stress the body is expose the body to just the air of uh, 20 to 23 degrees Celsius or 68 to 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Really? That's the best way to stress the body? Yes, in, in thermography. Um, the, uh, and of course, in some countries, women or men, we've even met men that don't want to take off their shirts, but it's really funny because how do they get examined by their doctor? It doesn't make sense, but sometimes it can, uh, um, Islamic countries or in China where they're very conservative, it might be more difficult to get them to take off their clothes, but they're, you know, they're, a woman is with a woman and that's doing the testing. And so it's usually fine. This is the mechanism by which we can measure on the skin that's reflecting back from the central nervous system and from the organ. But the central nervous system reaction to cool air stress occurs during a two minute interval. We look at the 10 minute interval. So we take our second measurement after 10 minutes and after 10 minutes is the spinal reflex arc that's coming from the organ. So we're getting only the information from the organ. The central nervous system response is long gone. And so we're able to take the points from the head zones. This is neuro neurology. This is pure neurology. Dr. Head was a physician, a neurologist in England in around 1910 to 1930. And he determined these areas of the body that we sample from that are connected to the organ. So we're not making this up. We're not coming up with some, uh, you know, uh, bioresonance. Uh, this device does a million things. We're uh, solely on physiology and neurology that's already known. So, uh, the, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. So these are the points that we measure. It takes five minutes to take the first 100 points and then the 10 minute cool down and then five minutes to take the second. And down below, you probably have a little delay, but this is the cool down 10 minutes. We take the first measurement, then they take their clothes off, then we do the second measurement. 
down below are all the configurations of the patterns that we can see with the points. They can get hotter, they can stay the same, or they can get cooler, or they can go too cool. So a point that actually overcompensates is seen often in autoimmune disease and in people that are uh, either toxic or have toxic processes or in the pelvic points can mean endometriosis or pelvic inflammatory disease. This is the thermogram uh, that Dr. Rost, the originator came up with of the top one. This is a Superman. There's no one that actually has this reaction. You'll notice that say in the neck region, the blue points are all the cooling. The black points are all the original first measurement points. So most of the points of the body cool about a half a degree to one degree. Now look at the bottom illustration. That is a cancer patient. There are points going every which way. This is called chaos, or we call it disorder. And it's been found that the more disorder there is, the more there is an indication for the neoplastic condition or the condition that could give rise to a tumor. So this is not saying a person has cancer. We can't know a cancer until we biopsy it and look at it with a pathology report. But we can give guesses and we can give ideas about where we can go with therapy. And then we can do another test because it's totally non-invasive. It has no radiation. It's only taking temperatures that are emanating already through infrared radiation from the skin. Yeah. So we can do as many tests as we want non-invasively. And so every month on a cancer patient, I usually want to monitor whether they're doing chemotherapy or they're doing natural therapies. Uh, we, can, we can see and we can monitor whether they're getting better or not according to their regulation system. They may feel worse, but the regulation system is better. That means the system might have to catch up with it or it's on another level. But if you correct the regulation system, the chances of them getting better are much greater. Here is, is an idea. Go ahead. Um, my question is, if someone believes they might have a predisposition to cancer, perhaps there's been a real cluster in their neighborhood, perhaps they seem to have a genetic tendency, is this something that they could take as a precautionary check? With Absolutely. Uh, like. Uh, <clears throat> Like um, with Jolie, Jolie and the people that are being told, oh, yes, you have a genetic predisposition for breast cancer. Okay, I'm going to get a double mastectomy. We could have told her, and I do see a number of Hollywood people, but uh, didn't, uh, unfortunately uh, for her, uh, we could see whether she had other factors that could contribute to warranting that kind of worry. Because what's important is not what you have in the genes, it's what's being expressed. Yes. So it's a, it's a very strange thing to me that there's a misunderstanding about that. If I have genes like my father died from a melanoma, if I have genes from melanoma, I can look and see what's happening in my gut because there is some evidence that melanoma may be fungal in its origin. Interesting. There, we can look and see whether there are, are my, microbial infections. If I had the gene for melanoma, I want to make the rest of my body as healthy as I can to minimize oh. the chance of, of triggering that gene. I don't want to cut all my skin off and say, no, I'm not going to get melanoma. See, yeah. I can still get it in my eye, by the way, or in other areas. But that's, that's a lack of, of logic. I, I sometimes wonder why conventional medicine has these little areas of these blind spots to their logic. Like, why do they go straight to drugs? Or uh, unless it's an emergency and, and conventional medicine is fantastic with emergency medicine. You can't say enough for it or surgery. Yeah, okay. Why do they rush on to drugs so fast? Because there's no drug without a side effect. If we go to herbs, most of them do not have a side effect. If we go to probiotics, most of them don't have a side effect. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Why don't you have, why don't they think 
to at least include that as part of what they want to do because they want, don't want to continue patients on drugs for their lives. Look at all the psychiatric drugs that are being used now. Why? Because there are imbalances in the brain chemistry. Why? Because of the gut. The gut is key to the brain as well as fatty acid metabolism. So I tell all my depression patients, I, uh, I had a bipolar patient this morning. She isn't on any drug, fortunately. We want to boost her fatty acids. We want to give her a non-toxic form of lithium that helps to modulate the nerve membrane to permeability factors. We want to help her autonomic nervous system and we want to have her exercise. To anyone bipolar, exercise is number one. I, I've had, I have a very good friend that reversed his bipolar. He was hospitalized seven times by uh, rigorous exercise. It's, you can't say enough for exercise, even in some cancers and multiple myeloma. It's been proven that exercise stimulates a certain type of immune response that's not done with any other uh, activity or chemical or herb or anything. And exercise does things that are beyond what we even understand today. We should never look at medicine as though we know everything today because in five years, we're gonna look back and say, oh, we don't do that anymore. Just like with chemotherapy and immunotherapy, they're gonna look back in 10 years from now and say, we don't do chemotherapy, or we might do it on three types of cancers, but immunotherapy is where it's at. I just got back from, from Malaysia, where uh, a professor of hepatology and immunology is setting up a, uh, a treatment laboratory for cancers using uh, antibodies that are specifically programmed by computer against those tumors. So he's, he's a conventional doctor. He's written 500 papers in hepatology and immunology. He has a position in one of the leading universities in Germany, and he's doing non-chemotherapy treatment of cancer. And he uses our machine, by the way, the regulation thermography, to know when he should dose his immunotherapy. So in conventional medicine, no matter what, we need to look and see when we should dose the patient. Is it every three weeks? Is it every two weeks? What is the nature of their response? Do they have an inflammatory uh, uh, a reaction initially, and then it comes down after two days, or after five days, or after seven days? Well, you don't want to start another therapy before it's come down to normalize again. We can see that here. Yeah. So it's, this is a fantastic tool, and yeah, we can. If I can just interrupt you there, you said that this is a doctor in Malaysia that's using your device, um, and I, I know you have the best part of 200 around the world now, and, and demand is growing strongly. Um, if somebody's listening um, and they feel that they would really benefit from this, or a loved one, or um, a, a colleague, or somebody who really needs to see a doctor using one of your machines, how can they find out where they are? Is there a referral list on your website, or... How can you help them in that way? You can, you can email me at drbeilin at alphatherm.com. He's also in Germany, so he's in uh, northern Germany, uh, associated with the university there, but he has a uh, doctor uh, named Nesselhut. His name is Fred Fendrick, but he works with Dr. Nesselhut. That's in a uh, town of Duderstadt, so uh, I can put them in touch with these doctors. It's not inexpensive, but if you compare it to chemotherapy, it's cheaper. It's around between twenty and thirty thousand dollars to go through a therapy, but um, it's the best uh, possibility for a long-term survival with many cancers. I can't tell you which ones because I've just established a relationship with them through facilitating them with our technology. So I'm young in the relationship. I can't tell you what the most effective cancers are, but I can put people in touch. And, and uh, doctors watching this can also come in touch with me, D-R-B-E-I-L-I-N at alphatherm.com. I'm sure you'll have the, the uh, information there. 
Um, we have uh, different cases that we've taken. We had a very interesting case of uh, here's an infrared camera that showed uh, a suspicion on this um, left breast in about the two o'clock position. And when we did our measurement, we found that there were two spots that we, we had concern. She, did, she elected to um, uh, um, uh, a uh, breast removal mastectomy. They sliced the breast through histology. The infrared only found one. The x-ray, the mammogram, only found one and our method found both. So wow. it's not that we replace mammograms, it's we're different. If you take two circles like this, we can do our thing and they can do their thing and combined we get about a 91% accuracy. With just mammography, it's about a 70%. With ours in physiology, we found around an 83%. When you use them together, it's the best because you have an image and then you have the factors of the physiology that are contributing or not. And look at this again, it comes back to the teeth, doesn't it? Two breast teeth affected, indicating strongly that every single tooth relates to a part of the body, which we're hearing more and more. That's true. And it's interesting because we, you know, I'm actually a doctor of oriental medicine, licensed acupuncturist, but um, we've had very few provings of the acupuncture meridians. And when we sometimes see, say, a, a person with liver disease, and we see on the thermogram that the points don't change temperature above the liver, we'll actually see three or four of the liver-related teeth become problematic in our test. So actually the liver can feed back to the teeth and we see, we can, so we can actually revalidate acupuncture. So it's, it's incredible what we've been able to find. Acupuncture is, uh, has a lot to be uh, desired, but they haven't had an instrument. The problem with acupuncturists is they don't have a scientific instrument. They read your pulse and you get another acupuncturist who says, no, you don't have that, you have this, and they never agree. They read the tongue, they might agree, but then what do they have that's really scientific? Nothing. This shows some traditional Chinese medicine correlations, and so we're adding that to the program. We'll be adding traditional Chinese medicine into the results of the thermography. Fantastic. Dr. Dr. Daniel Meehan, you've been absolutely so thoroughly um, educational for all of us. Um, and I, I just love the way this completely relates to energy, energetic imbalances, flows, etc. Um, and the fact that you're doing this remarkable work all around the world. And thank goodness for your benefactor, your wealthy patient who allowed you, enabled you rather. Well, we have about... We have about 20 investors and we're, we're, um, we're wanting to really boost this worldwide and we're thinking of making a, a smartphone version for rural areas in impoverished countries. So uh, we're available, again, you can reach me at either info, info at alpha, spelled like the Italian sports car, A-L-F-A dot global, info at alpha dot global, and uh, our website is alpha.global. That global is instead of a dot com, it's a dot global. I understand. Okay, well, Dr. Daniel Bielin, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. We're going to make sure that all of your information uh, and your contacts are on livingenergyday.com. Um, and this is being shared all around the world. Of course, it's live right now, a 24 hour marathon. Um, one of our next presenters, Michelle Reinhardt, is standing by to take over from you i'm going to have to say goodbye we could talk for hours um, and i'm so grateful to you so just oh, a very quick thank really you quick so much chat. thank you so much and let's keep in touch yeah definitely so that really get really quick recap i think what I, my takeaways were to look to the teeth um with the biological dentist um and to look for the cause mm, to look don't for the just, cause don't just take the 
end result, but look for other causes that, because none of us are just an isolated organ. We're contributing organs that actually endanger other organs. And if we remove the stress from the organs that are contributing, we, we stand a much better chance. So being able to understand those emotions and those stresses is key as well, isn't it? And your Absolutely. machine really illuminates and enables people to understand what's going on. It's mathematics and it's patterns and it's physiology. Well, thank you for the good work. Thank you to you and your colleagues, all of your investors. And I'm, I know we'll keep in touch and we'll hear a lot more um, of you and Alpha. Um, so remember everybody, alpha.global, not alpha.com, alpha.global is where to find this amazing work. Dr. Daniel Bailey, okay. thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye for now. Ah, well, what a fascinating, fascinating time that was. Um, I'm so grateful to the doctor. I'm going to be bringing on Michelle Reinhardt, who's going to be joining us as a panelist. Um, <laughs> actually going to be taking on the next step so um, when Michelle's ready we'll see her